Good evening, everybody. I would like to start by acknowledging the Bejigal and Gadigal people as the traditional custodians of the land, lands that we are on. I would like to pay my respects to elders, past and present, and extend that respect to any First Nations people who are with us this evening. As you've seen in the video, the Utsun Lecture Series are UNSW Built Environment's public lecture series. They're the opportunity and where we bring global leaders city making together to discuss the most pressing urban challenges we face. And these events are also an opportunity um, for the built environment community to gather together for staff, for students, for alumni, for industry, for friends and communities. And I would like to invite you after this lecture to gather together and please join us at the UNSW galleries just across the courtyard for drinks and canapes. You will also have the opportunity at that time to view the current exhibition in the galleries, which is a collection from jeweler and maker Blanche Tilden, who is celebrated for transforming industrial materials into wearable objects. So the Paul Reed Utzon Lecture, as the name suggests, honors Professor Paul Reed. And he was a former professor in the School of Built Environment and a leader in urban design in Australia. As a member of the UNSW Campus Development Committee, for example, in the 1990s, Professor Reed championed high quality public space in the evolution of our campus, the Quadrangle Building being a prime example for those who know the campus. Like Professor Reed, our speaker tonight, Dr. Rob Stokes, has put public places at the heart of urban design during an extensive political career. Rob Stokes was a state member for Pittwater from 2007 to 2023, and during that time he held a long list of ministerial portfolios, including, I have to take a breath now, um, infrastructure, cities, active transport, transport and roads, planning and public spaces, education, environment, heritage, and the central coast. I'm sure you'll agree that's quite the portfolio. As Australia's first member, Minister Sai, for public spaces and for active transport, Rob established the Greater Sydney Parklands to govern metropolitan Sydney's green spaces. He prepared New South Wales' first active transport strategy to double the number of people walking and cycling across the state. Amidst the pandemic, Rob led reforms to planning rules to make use of public spaces easier and improve the delivery of alfresco dining, street parties, and cycleways. He is a member of the International Commission on Creating Healthy Cities and made global recommendations on how to build better urban environments in the wake of the pandemic. Beyond this, Rob has been and continues to be a strong friend of the UNSW City Planning Program. Uh, just last year, we were Really delighted to have Rob uh, join us at the launch of the UNSW Cities Institute, and he's been a frequent and very welcome visitor to our planning classrooms, where he shared his passion for planning and policy. What this impressive list of achievements shows is a tremendous commitment to sustainable and healthy urban development, and a genuine interest in supporting our next generation of planners. Rob has always put the people of New South Wales and Australia first, prioritising well-being and social cohesion. He has approached his work with intellectual rigour and been willing to make hard decisions in aid of a prosperous community. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker for the Paul Reed 2023 Upson Lecture, addressing the issue deciding Sydney's density destiny, <laughs> Dr Rob Stuck. Scottish sociologist and nascent town planner Patrick Geddes saw the city as subject, not object, declaring that a city is more than a place in space, it is a drama through time. Drawing, drawing on his early training as a botanist, Geddes conceptualised cities as, as living organisms, comprising complex interlinked systems developing dynamically. He wasn't alone. Planners, social theorists and designers have often deployed anthropomorphic metaphors to explain urban growth and change. Roads and rivers are arteries, parks and plazas are lungs, schools, universities are the brain, 
parliaments perform perhaps a more execrable purpose, as Tony Abbott suggested, the suppository of wisdom. <laughs> uh, in this plan of Nantes, uh, Pierre Rousseau shaped the city as a stylized heart. Writers across history have assumed the personhood of places. Consider Marcel Proust or Henry James' descriptions of Venice, Nietzsche or Hugo describing Paris, or more ancient biblical personifications of Jerusalem or Babylon. Cities are even ascribed epithets of personality. The city of lights, the city eternal, the windy city, the forbidden city, or closer to home, the emerald city. Just as cities receive personalities, they, like us, have destinies. As people grow, cities grow. As people mature, cities mature. And just as all of us are subject to the consequences of our choices, so too are cities shaped by their experience. Tonight, I will examine, sorry, I will examine an aspect of a wider teleological question about the urban morphology of cities. A question repeated across many metropolises grappling with the challenge of growth, up or out. Using our hometown as my case study, I, I want to ask you to consider how we want Sydney's growth to be accommodated. But first we must briefly consider the question of growth itself. Population growth in Sydney is less a choice than a destiny. History explains that cities can contract, but generally from gradual decline or sudden calamity, not a conscious choice by its citizens. Declining national birth rates, resource depletion, economic change can all precipitate urban decomposition, which can then generate a divider effect where declining prosperity can spawn crime, inflate inequality, undermine infrastructure performance and increase infrastructure costs, fermenting currents of decay. US Rust Belt cities like St Louis have seen urban populations plummet, while a declining rate base in undermines the provision of basic human needs, like safe drinking water in Flint, Michigan, as described by Anna Clark. Conversely, sustainable urban growth is correlated with rising prosperity, creativity, equality and justice. A as with all generalisations, there are of course exceptions. But the basic formula remains. Shrinking cities are less equal, less safe, less prosperous and less healthy than growing cities. To stunt or artificially constrain Sydney's growth would be an act of self-harm. Sydney will grow. The choice is how. Debates about the future shape of growing cities are often presented as a simple choice between density or sprawl, where urban growth can be accommodated either by intensifying development in existing suburbs or by facilitating continual outward expansion on the urban periphery. Either choice has detractors. Urban consolidation is criticised for destroying the amenity of existing suburban areas, while urban expansion is criticised for displacing valuable farmland or people and jobs over vast distances, let alone impact on biodiversity. Both density and sprawl can generate negative environmental impacts, with increased density blamed for congestion and urban pollution, and sprawl blamed for inefficient use of natural resources. In contemporary Sydney, however, the debate between sprawl and densification has largely been settled by geography and economics with urban consolidation the agreed planning orthodoxy. National parks to the north, south and west of the city serve as a fixed urban growth boundary, while constraints imposed by flooding in the northwest, coal mining and water catchment in the southwest are gradually but inexorably extinguishing opportunities for outward urban expansion. Proposals for satellite cities and new towns beyond the metropolitan region are curtailed by complex transport and connectivity constraints, prohibitively expensive to overcome. In, in light of these spatial and infrastructure constraints, and with a million more residents expected by 2041, the real choice facing Sydney is not whether to densify, but rather how to densify. The alternatives are between a hard density future, urban form, characterised by multiple clusters of tall apartment buildings in designated urban clusters and corridors, or a soft density strategy of smaller apartment blocks and terrace housing over a large a proportion of the metropolis. Currently, Sydney is following a hard density trajectory, so that over the coming decades, large corridors through the middle ring suburbs will resemble the dense 
the dense functionalist urban typologies envisaged by planners and architects like Le Cabazier. Other parts of the city will remain largely unchanged, creating a, shockle, uh, a shocking spatial segregation of urban form between high density corridors and a vast density of, of uh, and a vast hinterland of, of remnant low density suburbia more reflective of the, of the broad acre city philosophy promoted by Frank Lloyd Wright and realised in post-war suburban ideals like Levittown here in Pennsylvania. As Bill Randolph and Andrew Tice observed in 2016, the urban form of Sydney will be increasingly shaped by the spatial fragmentation of density. So why has a hard density development strategy trajectory for Sydney emerged? Urban morphology is shaped by historical patterns of development. Sydney's inner suburbs, subdivided before the expansion of the Metropolitan Rail Network, are characterised by terrace housing and small lot sizes. However, with many inner residential precincts of city, Sydney previously blighted by substandard sewage, drainage and building practices, as well as poor light and ventilation, nascent municipal councils lobbied for rights to exclude terrace housing from early emerging suburbs surrounding inner city. With the passage of the Local Government Act in 1919, most municipal councils took the opportunity to prohibit terrace housing and townhouse developments through the proclamation of residential districts in which row houses or apartment houses were banned. A range of factors also combined to create an urban geography marked by separated land uses and a pattern of large residential allotments with narrow frontages and deep backyards. Strict categorisation of all Crown land proclaimed for sale required lots to be designated as town, suburban or country, with suburban lots being up to two acres in area. Strict laws requiring street widths, road frontages and lot size established a city with a metropolitan character from the early days of the metropolis. By the 1880s, Sydney's population density stood at four people per acre across 96,000 acres, with Australia identified as the most urbanised nation on earth by the end of the 19th century. Emerging town planning ideas such as the Garden Cities movement in the UK and a desire to isolate residential areas from industry led to the adoption of fixed land use zones. With most residential subdivision being undertaken by private developers, there was an economic incentive to shake lots with narrow frontages that would limit the liability of purchasers to pay rates then based on the width of the property frontage and deep backyards to minimise the amount of land the developer would need to dedicate to the suburban road network. Large suburban allotments also allowed for on-site water storage, garbage and sewage management for which the minimum lot size imported from early US municipal subdivision standards was around 10,000 square feet or quarter an acre. Where sewage infrastructure was already provided, a smaller lot size of 4,000 square feet was mandated, explaining why so many post-war Australian lots are 556 square metres being imported from a US subdivision standard. Up until the 1940s, the pattern of suburban expansion through middle ring suburbs left a legacy of large, long, thin allotments, difficult to subdivide given their deliberately narrow frontages, demonstrated in this subdivision plan for Hurlston Park. As the imperative to increase residential density emerged with rapid post-war growth and migration and escalating costs to expand urban infrastructure, the only feasible ways of redeveloping existing suburban blocks were to amalgamate lots, uh, to facilitate the development of large apartment buildings, or to create new tenures and building typologies that could be retrofitted to match the dominant subdivision pattern, as shown in the aerial photograph of the same subdivision today. So there you can see a well, veritable potpourri of different development types uh, based on the capacity either to use uh, the extant subdivision pattern or to amalgamate some lots. The introduction of strata legislation in the 1960s and the abolition of legislation restricting building heights enabled a proliferation of residential towers on larger con uh, consolidated sites and of so-called six-pack or gun barrel style residential flat buildings like this one in Hurlston Park, one of those uh, in the earlier image. 
uh, throughout inner and mid middle ring suburbs. They're called dingbats for some reason in Los Angeles, where the shape of the buildings was retrofitted to match the long, thin allotments that the earlier subdivision pattern had created. The resultant urban form, to quote Bill Randolph and Bill Robert Freestone, is a disorganised mix of redevelopment, uh, poorly integrated in terms of strict design with low quality visual amenity and open space provision and little consideration of longer term needs. And that's illustrated by that earlier photo that shows so many different development types that are shaped by the cadaster upon which they're based, not the other way around. As pressure for more efficient land use in existing urban areas escalated with continuing population growth, the focus for urban consolidation moved to former industrial or special purpose lands left unused through economic change. Such brownfield sites, such as the former gas works at Waverton uh, and the former brick pit at Kirawi, provided an opportunity for master planned high density residential communities where the, sh the form, as you can see between these two images, um, gives you the context to change things quite dramatically. However, these opportunities were largely exhausted by the end of the 20th century, with the emphasis shifting to the identification uh, for options uh, for, redevelopment, uh, for intensive redevelopment of residual government-owned brownfield sites, like railway lands around Central uh, and ports land around Roselle, or, or residential precincts that were strung along existing or proposed transport corridors, such as the Sydenham to Bankstown metro line. Such transit-oriented development continues to characterise the dominant hard density approach adopted by planners in Sydney. Uh, some centres uh, all already, and here you can see the centres that are strung out along that Sydenham to Bankstown route, uh, and, uh, and you can see the sorts of densities uh, that are contemplated in this original uh, draft strategy. Some centres, uh, such as Haymarket for example, already developed have densities of more than 15,000 people per hectare compared to the average across Sydney uh, of Sydney's land of a little more than 2,500 people per hectare. For comparison, Brisbane's most densely populated precincts have less, less than half the population density of the most densely settled parts of Sydney, while the most densely settled suburbs of Hobart have fewer people than the average across urban land in Sydney. So there is quite a, uh, a dramatic juxtaposition between hyperdense parts of Sydney uh, and the average across, uh, the, um, ac across the remainder of urban lands. Regulatory costs reinforced the starkly segregated patterns of urban density unconsciously facilitated by subdivision and land use planning over the past two centuries. Georgist preference for securing the highest and best use of land is implicit in systems of planning, land valuation, rating and taxation. The legal and tax costs of land dealings and development create powerful incentives for developers to push beyond a planning envelope rather than to build within it. A hard density outcome helps amortise unavoidable costs that kick in once a particular scale is surpassed. Fire systems, ramps, lifts, parking. While social and environmental reason might prefer softer forms of density, legal and regulatory costs mean 20 or 30 storeys are far more economically rational than three or four. Political considerations also reinforce emerging patterns of spatial fragmentation of density with hard density being the most politically palatable form of urban consolidation, at, at least in the short term. Identifying particular precincts for intensive urban development allows politicians to focus development a, a, away from the majority of existing suburban areas, quelling community fears about changes to the urban form of their existing local neighbourhood. Uh, like, a sac like a sacrificial in uh, anode might do on an outboard motor engine, for example. The, the logic is clear. Better to have acute localised op uh, op opposition to very high density in a few places than a broad groundswell of political opposition to urban change everywhere. Such utilitarianism has led politicians to retreat from what um, Parisian urban planner Anastasia Tawati termed incentive policies of soft densification across broader areas of metropolis in favour of interventionist policies of hard densification in targeted precincts. 
In Sydney, this political planning approach has informed the development of priority growth areas along rail corridors and other areas targeted for intensive residential redevelopment, initially called urban activation precincts, abbreviated in this slide to UAP, which for context is not a reference to Clive Palmer. <laughs> However, community resistance such, or it would work equally well, but anyway, uh, but, but community resistance, such as demonstrated in this image, discredited the phrase of urban activation precincts, so it was changed to planned precincts. Once it was pointed out that the phrase planned precincts implied nowhere else was planned, the euphemisms were finally and thankfully replaced with titles that actually expressed what, the, what process they signalled, being state-led strategic planning, collaborative planning between the state and the local council, or a straight uh, state-led rezoning or, or, or a straight council-led rezoning. A hard density trajectory is both the path of least resistance following established subdivision patterns and public transport corridors and also as a defensive reaction to political opposition uh, to urban consolidation in the middle ring suburbs. Hard density is being imposed on Sydney not through public consensus but rather because it is structurally and politically easier to do. So why then might a soft density trajectory be a better fit for Sydney? So some of the most strident arguments against a hard density trajectory relate to the negative impacts of intense densification on amenity and quality of life for existing and future residents. Pursuing a human scale, medium density trajectory for Sydney's growth provides a balance between maintaining the character of existing precincts while ensuring more efficient use of urban space and the concomitant transport, health and environmental benefits. Some of the most diverse, vibrant and desired parts of the city are those with a soft density urban form, including the gentrified inner eastern and inner western suburbs. While urban consolidation is designed in part to achieve sustainable urban development, Multiple studies across Australian and international cities have demonstrated that a hard density typology of high rise and extreme high density and also even medium rise apartment dwellings over a very significant clustered area may be less environmentally sustainable than adopting a soft density approach over a much wider area. Large apartment complexes create overshadowing and face many technical and legal constraints to the use of renewable energy. Intense high density development can exacerbate the heat island effect, amplifying the impact of a changing climate and accelerating requirements for electrical cooling. Lower medium density housing forms have lower energy demand per capita when compared to detached houses or high and medium density apartment buildings. Heavy concentrations of high and medium density housing can also reduce availability of land that is permeable and planted, generating negative impacts on local ecology, drainage and microclimate. And while higher density developments should decrease dependence on private motor vehicles, apartment developers fiercely resist efforts by state and local governments to relax parking requirements for new apartment towers, undermining a fundamental environmental argument to support their product. And without a strategic approach to densification across metropolitan areas, visitors to high density precincts will still need their private motor vehicle to travel from a vast suburban hinterland. While increasing residential density is attributable to an increasing population, the impetus for densification is accelerated by an increasing proportion of one and two family households as the number of children per household shrinks and as Australia's population ages. Shrinking household size is generating a widening mismatch between existing housing supply and housing needs and preferences. The large detached dwellings that comprise much of Sydney's historical housing stock simply don't meet the needs of an ageing population and more complex family structures. A similar di disparity between housing supply and housing preference has been observed in North American cities moving from a suburban to an urban built form. Building centralised high-rise might meet the demand for smaller dwellings, but not in the existing suburban areas where they're required. Moreover, multi-storey apartment buildings don't provide the freehold title which allows greater flexibility in renovating a home to meet changing domestic arrangements over time. Softer densities over broader areas also avoid the negative social consequences of clustered intensive residential high-rise. While close to amenities, many studies indicate residents in these complexes feel isolated. 
Part of this might be attributable to higher vacancy rates, with many new apartments used as a safe haven to park foreign capital and left untenanted. Security gates may also have the unintended consequence of separating residents from civic society, a malaise observed of other gated communities. I recall uh, one uh, distinguished lobbyist once explaining to me that politicians don't listen to high-rise unit dwellers because they couldn't door knock them. I resisted the temptation to explain the irony that it was the built environment itself that deprived apartment residents of access to a political voice. And while an owner's corporation might operate as a grassroots democracy in a six pack, the management of complex common pool resources in a strata including many hundreds of units creates new scales of privatised urban governance not envisaged when strata laws were created. Sydney's residential development market is dominated by large property companies, many foreign owned or controlled. Shifting the focus from developing large apartment complexes to also include lower medium density housing has the potential to disrupt existing market structure and increase competition. Facilitating lower density uh, suburban development or, or the missing middle on existing suburban allotments increases opportunities for a larger cohort of existing residents to access the latent land rent locked up by historical zoning patterns. While high and medium rise apartments concentrate the uplift in property values to a very few large developers and socialise the congestion and lost amenity costs across the surrounding low density community, soft density development allows existing homeowners to share in the value of less dramatic urban change over a broader area. Soft density thus effectively democratises the planning gain, recognising the fundamental role of private property rights in planning laws and resonating with the expectation ingrained in, in the psyche of many Australian homeowners that they have the opportunity to realise the maximum capitalisation of their land, a point uh, that Simon Pinnegar has made. Soft density alternatives such as terraces, townhouses, villas and manor houses all provide denser forms of residential development while retaining the advantages offered by freehold title access to private open space and built form more compatible with the traditional suburban model that shaped Sydney's character. Soft density represents the, the Goldilocks approach to achieving residential density across Sydney. Not too dense and not too sprawled. So how can we change course and include a soft density future for Sydney? First, we need to look for inspiration from the right places. Not all cities are the same. Like people, some cities have shared experiences, even familial traits. Others come from completely different backgrounds and perspectives. Just as it is ignorant and insensitive to assume all people react the same, it is naive to assume that a particular policy approach will succeed across different urban contexts. The apartments of 19th century Paris, Madrid or Copenhagen, the ones that Jorn Utzon would have been familiar with, were not built according to contemporary disability, fire or parking standards. The best place to look for inspiration is to the solutions being adopted in cities with a similar DNA, such as colonial settler cities in North America and New Zealand, which developed in mid-latitudes at the same time under similar legal and political systems with shared cultural and technological environments and facing similar structural impediments to achieving soft density outcomes. The easiest changes to make are those that aren't particularly noticeable. For example, Washington State in the US and New South Wales in Australia both allow for the development of granny flats, now more sensitively named accessory or, access or auxiliary dwelling units adjacent to existing detached houses without needing council approval. Such hidden soft density solutions have made an appreciable difference to the supply and diversity of lower cost rental accommodation. But while helpful, they're not sufficient, not anywhere near sufficient to meet housing demand. More substantial soft density solutions include the introduction of a range of what are variously referred to as missing middle or low rise medium density style housing policies in US and Australian states, Canadian provinces and New Zealand where uh, the new medium density residential standards grant as of right development approval up to three storeys on urban land across all of uh, New Zealand's five largest cities. Similar as of right upzoning entitlements, albeit less permissive, have also been introduced in US states uh, and in the New South Wales Low Rise Housing Diversity Code, which permits dual occupancies, manor houses and terraces to be carried out under a fast-tracked complying development approval, again without council or community involvement. And here's an example in the 
Uh, upper left-hand corner is Manly. Uh, the bo bottom left-hand corner is uh, Penrith. Uh, and the main photo is at Blacktown of, of some of these sorts of uh, um, uh, realisations of, of soft density in the Australian uh, middle ring or Sydney's middle ring suburbs. While it's early days, I suspect that these approaches will ultimately be seen to have limited success because they ignore the democratic basis of our planning system, that people accept urban change because they can participate in it. The problem with code and as of right approaches is they're styled as a choice but presented as a fait accompli. I prefer a more democratic approach, not, not a false and negative choice where resident objectors believe they can stop housing development altogether, but a genuine and positive choice where neighbours can participate in improving an application that meets predetermined development standards. There are precedents. The Housing State Environmental Planning Policy and its antecedents in Sydney, have, in New South Wales, have long provided opportunities for soft density incentives for targeted housing typologies, for affordable and accessible housing, for example, in low density neighbourhoods. Councils and communities retain the right to determine such development, but decisions must be based on development standards that permit higher, albeit still modest, forms of density than applicable to the development of single detached homes in the same location. <clears throat> I learned about shaping choices at dinner time with my toddlers. An open choice, what would you like, was either too confusing to respond to or was answered by a chorus of ice cream. <laughs> Neither choice being acceptable. Choices need to be crafted. Would you like carrots or would you prefer peas? The choice was real but curated. Civic leadership requires all of us to help shape positive choices about housing development in our communities. Robert Freestone has written about the strong history of town planning associations in suburban Australia in the first half of the 20th century. Today, progress associations often exist to stop development rather than to shape it. We have a renewed imperative for urban planning to be facilitated through grassroots community engagement not stopped by it. The irony is the interests of resident objectors, as all urban citizens, are better served by soft density typology spread more evenly across the city. Resisting the, inevitably, resisting the inevitability of urban growth simply means being overwhelmed by it. As the Roman poet Seneca wrote, the willing destiny guides them, the unwilling destiny drags them. Rather than waste energy debating things that won't change, debate should focus on the things that can, like positive liberties to manage, restore and celebrate public spaces between private property, not the traditional negative focus on limiting how private owners can develop housing on their own land. Most land in cities is actually publicly owned, yet planning narratives focus more on our rights to object than our obligations to share. How we organise shared spaces, our parks, our roads, our schools, our public housing estates will ultimately have a greater impact on the density of Sydney's urban form than pointless skirmishes on modest increases in the scale of housing. According to Carl Jung, until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you will call it fate. We do have a choice about the urban morphology of our future city. The fact that we don't choose between hard or soft density makes the hard density trajectory we pursue by default appear undemocratic. But our failure to decide is either based on ignorance that we have a choice or petulance in refusing to make it. Just as our own fates are shaped by our personal decisions, so too does the desti density destiny of our built environment bear the consequence of our civic choices. So let's choose wisely. Um, I'm Professor Simon Pinnegar. I'm the director of the city planning program here at UNSW. My colleague, Susan Thompson, Professor Susan Thompson on our right. And our task uh, this evening is to steward, hopefully a, a vibrant uh, uh, and active, hopefully 
provocative in both directions discussion on on Rob's talk. Um, now, I'm sure you've got lots and lots to ask, and I was just going to give you two minutes to uh, think of your questions, and we're going to start. You, you probably remember when you, you signed up for tonight's event uh, that many of you would have submitted a, a, a question uh, as part of that sign up, and we've got a few pre-questions, uh, and I think Susan's chosen one, and we've, we've chosen one which we're going to kick off things with. So without further ado, Susan. Thank you, Simon, and thank you, Rob, for a very provocative and incredibly insightful lecture. Now I've got a, a question for you from Jane Partridge, who's a UNSW al alum, to start things off while everyone's thinking about their other questions. Rob, how do we balance public participation expectations, which are set in planning legislation, of existing communities, landowners, against the broader and growing needs of the whole community to have greater housing diversity? That's an extraordinarily complex question. Can you hear me all right? I might. No, I think we, I, we need it. Like you for, for for, oh, terrific. Oh, you, you I, might. I might. Okay. I might. Okay. <laughs> uh, that's an extraordinarily complex question because the public, I mean, the, the question begs, who's the public? Uh, there are multiple publics and you have to select whichever public you're speaking about and of course in development because the decisions and what makes planning and architecture and the built environment such compelling profession is because the decisions you make quite literally you know that uh, the phrase you know living on the wrong side of the tracks well these professions determine where the tracks go so you're actually determining the context of people's lives it's actually a, a uh, it's, it's really the application of, of landscapes that will form a just community or an unjust community based on spatiality. So determining the right public is imperative. Uh, and, um, and often resident objectors, almost by nature, are propertied. So they're actually a, a wealthier cohort, particularly in the context of current Sydney. So they have every right. In fact, they have legal rights um, to participate. And funnily enough, when the planning legislation was created in the late 70s, uh, the, uh, the open standing rights were probably not the, the, the rights of an open standing were probably not as uh, important as they are today because they actually, the property, right, property owners already, always had rights to participate based on real property law and the rights, um, the common law um, uh, torts of nuisance uh, um, and trespass gave them rights to participate. But the general public didn't. Uh, so planning law was the first that actually provided a voice to third parties. Uh, and, uh, and you know, that's now been extrapolated through court uh, decisions to include the interests of future generations, uh, increasingly also the voiceless uh, animals and plants as well. Um, so it's, it's appreciating all those voices. Um, how do you curate that? Uh, well, that is the job of gifted planners, but it's also forming those choices. I think, um, like my toddlers, um, and by the way, if that photo was taken today, that actually someone would get hurt. Um, but, uh, but nevertheless, um, uh, I've seen it. You, you see, I've been that there. A parent in a restaurant, you know, sort of saying, "What would you like?" Um, well, you know, that's a hopeless choice to give a toddler. You need to curate the choice, and you need to explain what the choices are and what the consequences of those choices are. Uh, and that's why uh, planning interventions, carefully done, are really important. That's why you can't really legislate it effectively. So a lot of the detritus in planning laws about, oh, you've got to advertise it for 40 days or, or, or these sorts of things, th that's not terribly meaningful because it's not getting the sorts of engagement that we actually need to make an informed decision. That's great. Okay, are you ready to go? Um, now we have a roving mic. There's a student ambassador there. Give us a wave. There you are. Um, I'm, I'm going to be, try and be as democratic as possible here. Um, and I'm going to take it one at a time. So if you can keep your questions concise, that'd be wonderful. Then we'll get through a lot. I can see that Mr. Stephen McMahon has his hand up here. Thanks. Rob, I was going to call you Minister. <laughs> um, but what was really fascinating, and it's bookending your last comment, you, you were planning minister twice, and you tried hard to implement sort of the, the vision that you had. Brad Hazard, before you tried to do the same thing, you, you guys have a really short window to actually affect some change. And the only people that can really do that are the government in place at the time. Have you got any lessons for your successor on what they can do in their short window? Uh, 
You're right, you don't know how long you've got. Um, I uh, once heard that the average lifespan of a minister in a Westminster democracy is about 18 months. Uh, in fact, in my career, that was pretty close to the mark. I got moved around a fair bit. Um, fortunately, I got the opportunity to be planning minister twice. Uh, and the, the challenge is you've got to have a narrative between different ministries as well. I think um, one of the things I learned was I had a cunning plan with the uh, medium density, the uh, low rise medium density code. It was to put it out as a code to freak out all the councils so they would say, don't give us a code, instead give us development standards uh, and then we can determine it. But you telling it, because councils, I've learned, they don't might mind making decisions, they just don't want to be blamed for them. So they want someone to blame. So if the state government can give them development standards, they can literally say to communities, look, we'd love to, to do what you want, but our hands are tied, what do we do? Um, and so they were actually looking for those development standards. Unfortunately, I wasn't in the chair at the time and the code was rolled out as a code. And then all the councils fell to type and resisted it because it was a code. And the problem with codes is, is they, they don't provide the opportunity to participate in decision making. That might be fine with, with less consequential forms of development, but the more significant a, an urban intervention is, the, the more important it is for people to be able to have their say on it. For a, you know, a standard detached house in the suburbs, it probably doesn't matter terribly much. Um, uh, and that you can impose setbacks and those sorts of things that you can comply with. But when you're going to um, forms of development where design matters more because they're more noticeable and have greater impacts on their neighbours, uh, you can provide certain clear standards um, that must be met. It's a bit like curating the choice. Um, I guess my lived experience was uh, move quicker because you never know when your number's up. It's a good lesson for life, actually. <laughs> okay, Nessa, um, can we... Um uh, introduce ourselves when we uh, get the mic and, and could you wait to ask your question until the mic gets to you so uh who's next uh, i think aaron there uh, hi i'm aaron peterson uh currently a planning student at usw and also a power planner at the department of planning um sydney's in a unique position right now where we're basically master planning bradfield the new aerotropolis new airport several new metro stations how do we go tell the public this is what the future we want, where there's medium rise density? How do we go do, do it from the start? Let's not keep building low rise houses next to Ludlam Station. Let's build tall stories. How do we tell them this is the future? Let's go. So in many sprawling low density environments, you've got the opposite problem. The economics don't, the economics, the way that the structural impediments work in our city, the sort of development that people would really like their city to look like is the hardest bit to actually deliver feasibly. So the, um, the volume developers uh, in Bradfield will be wanting to build sprawling low density uh, in the same way as developers around you know, uh, Hurlston Park will be wanting to build towers. Um, and yet in both examples, the, the, in, in both those um, instances, um, maybe planners and communities want something somewhere in the middle, which is sort of part of the point of my talk. I think part of the way we can resolve it, and if I had another hour, I would have talked about subdivision patterns themselves. It, it, it fascinates me. I was trying to figure out, you know, where does this problem start? It actually starts with the surveyors who actually aren't design trained at all because they, and they act on the basis of, I mean, I, I had no idea, for example, that rates originally, and in some uh, uh, Canadian provinces, rates are still charged on the basis of frontages, um, which provided this economic incentive to narrow the lot size, um, which is creating all sorts of headaches for redevelopment today. I mean, the, the challenges I found with the, um, uh, you know, the, in trying to re, um, reset the way in which we look at design planning with the design and place SEP, uh, it, it, it occurred to me, some developers were saying, look, we, we can't achieve standards on this site. Uh, well, let's make the sites better in the first place. And that's why the Urban Design Guide was such an important part of that um, document, because it was actually talking about getting the cadastres right in the first place. Start with an appreciation of country. I mean, you know, this land has been settled since the dreaming, so there's 
plenty of advice out there about uh, how to look at land and orientating development on land. Uh, and the settlement patterns should all be developed and based on that knowledge, and that's where we should start from. And so I think the, the answer to the question is, get the subdivision patterns. Don't worry so much about the development on them at this stage. Get the subdivision patterns right so they can be retrofitted in the future. And if feasibility at this stage says there has to be a few detached houses, well, that's fine, provided the frontages are long enough that you can replace them um, in 20 years' time and don't build them, you know. Um, and th then the other question becomes the, the, the moral hazard of developing something that you know will be disposed of in 20 years' time and what do you do with those resources and so forth. Um, but the, the nature of urban change is buildings change, uh, subdivisions don't. So get them right. Chapman here. Drawing two of those threads together of the city, city as an organism and your notion of an informed menu to make selections from, where do you see the relationship between the ability to provide proper public transport and the selection of densities? That's why I had my little dig in there at um, the objections of the uh, development sector um, to um, reducing the requirements for car parking in North City. Because I would have thought that's one of your best arguments for higher densities. And yet you're making the argument that we need cars as well. Now that's a recipe for urban congestion in the most congested places. Um, if we are to pursue transit-oriented development, which I believe we should, then the quid pro quo is it shouldn't be based on uh, vehicular access. Of course, there should be opportunity to that and the market should be able to decide. But what we're talking about then is reducing mandated standards. Developers can provide them if they want to um, and if that's what the market wants, but they won't be required to by development standards. That's why I find uh, that debate um, so frustrating um, because they're actually undermining one of the greatest arguments for the product they provide. And I'm not suggesting for, for one moment that we shouldn't have high rise in the right locations, of course we should, but we should create incentives for the bit in, the, in between as well, which currently is just so difficult to provide for. But you also find that things like um, uh, all, all you know, the, I, I want to use the phrase the 15 minute neighbourhood, but no doubt I'll get in trouble with anti-vaxxers, but, but, um, <laughs> but, but um, we don't need to live directly on top of one another for, um, for, for public transit to make sense. Because we can also rely on active transport connections between these sorts of places as well. Um, I think that, that, that magic number of 15, 15 minutes is, is crucial. Uh, and so to provide densities appropriate for context, um, but not everything has to be 30 storeys tall, I guess is my point. Um, I'm Green Building Council, but as much as density is important, do you think the planning system is going far enough to ensure that all the housing we get is of high quality? Because I look at Waterloo and all that housing seems to be going to pull apart in the next 20 to 30 years. Do you think the property sector is at the point where they can reflect on themselves and understand that they've got to reach higher standards? No. Um, and and um, I think I'm actually, I've been a real advocate of built to rent. And the reason is it creates an incentive for um, the listed property trusts to actually, no, I, I'm not suggesting they don't, they follow the standards. And we do actually, I know there's, you know, very, um, uh, there's lots of publicised accounts of, uh, in, in a, um, you know, insufficient building standards, but globally we're actually pretty good. When you consider for a moment, I mean, you, you know, I remember um, Volkswagen, the car company, got in huge trouble for, um, you know, had to do a massive product to recall, but when you think, Every one of the cars they produce is done in the same factory, under the same conditions, on the same production line, whereas every building that's built is entirely different. So the skills of the people who provide them are absolutely extraordinary. We have skilled engineers, we've got skilled planners, skilled designers, many of them trained here at UNSW. So we, 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 we should celebrate uh, the quality of our built environment, but that's not to say we're there yet. Um, uh, I think but we're excited with Build to Rent provides an option for listed property trusts, not just to own logistics hubs and shopping centres, but residential property over a longer um, period. So it's an incentive for them to build it really well because they're going to be owning it in 30, 40 years time. Um, so 
um, not just standards, but looking at other instruments to incentivise people to do the right thing. And that's one of the reasons I like Build to Rent as one example, because it's actually disrupting the speculative model you know, of, the, of the, the, the spec builder who comes along like a locust, builds something, flogs it, and then it's someone else's problem. This is an Australian challenge we've had. We tend, as Australians, we tend to look at the sticker price, but not the ongoing operational costs. So one of the challenges with um, getting the development community over the line on the cost benefit analysis for the design and place set, for example, and some of the basic standards in there was w without saying it so directly, but from a developer's perspective, really, they're not terribly concerned about uh, what happens in the property in seven years' time, whether it's operating efficiently. That's the owner's problem. So we need to create those incentives to, to ensure that builders actually care about how a building operates over its lifetime. Um, and builder's warranty insurance is, it, well, A, it doesn't mean anything, um, but B, it, it's, it's a negative incentive, not a positive incentive. They're doing the right thing because they're scared that they'll get in trouble if they don't, rather than creating incentives to do it properly in the first place, which is what um, uh, uh, built to rent uh, investment does. Can you give us practitioners an ideal population target to consider for Sydney within its geographic constraints? What's your intuition say? Well, um, Singapore has the same population as Sydney. It fits within 719 and a half square kilometres. They filled in a little bit, so they got a bit more. Um, we have more than 12,000 square kilometres. So we can fit an awful lot of people. Um, you know, Greater Tokyo fits in Greater Sydney um, quite comfortably, and it's got, what, 30-something million. So I, I don't think um, we've got plenty of land. We have used it terribly inefficiently because we could. The challenge is, of course, because we've subdivided it and because our processes of Torrens title subdivision are so incredibly effective, it's really hard to retrofit uh, once it's been determined. Um, and the first thing we can look at is all the bits we've wasted on the way through. Brownfield sites are a good example of that, but former transport lands or existing transport lands building over railway lines. Um, I, I'm cons I, my only political comment would be I would encourage the the incumbent state government not to lose sight of the opportunity to develop the airspace above central because I understand they're talking about ditching it but the problem is if they ditch it they'll never be able to do it uh, and that airspace will be locked in forever because the, the trains are getting it's becoming too busy to actually um, uh, operationally close the the railway line to put the the deck on um, so we need to think much more thoughtfully about our space, but we do have plenty of it, um, which is why I go a bit mental inside when I see councils resisting opportunities to redevelop car parks, for goodness sake. Uh, they should be the first place we're looking at. Okay. Can you I'm a politician one? still. I'm not going to... No, um, a, a number. I, I, I can't tell you. We can accommodate a great many more people um, and uh, I think countries that have sought to control population too far one way or the other have got themselves in trouble. Um, ultimately, these are democratic choices. I don't believe the, um, you know, the, 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 that um, we should support our economy with a great Ponzi scheme of importing people just for the hell of it. But equally, I don't think we should limit people's freedom to move around the planet. So uh, somewhere between those two extremes, I suppose. <laughs> Um, is it possible just to pass the mic forward to... Um, thanks for the lecture, it was fantastic. Um, my question is really about the potential of the missing metal and the typologies that that offers and, and the thesis I like. But the reality in Sydney with the wealth divide between the East and the West and the land values that are embedded in that have made it a complete, um, almost Im impossibility in terms of market demand and expectations from the eastern city. So as someone like myself who sits on regional local planning panels across the inner rings, I've seen density being sacrificed time and time again in multiple local government areas where affordability is pressing for bigger, um, you know, um, apartment buildings which had 20 to 30 apartments now 
being redeveloped for eight apartments. Um, apartment buildings which are new being uh, objected to by neighbours, being put in, getting approval, you know, a court approval, putting in the car park and then a modification to revert it to a dwelling, one single dwelling. But it was, you know, again, accommodating eight apartments and a reasonable development with eight apartments because the market would enable a single dwelling with car parking for 10 cars. Um, and not only that, the the scale of the development. So we're not only losing density in these inner rings, but the scale of the development at a per, you know within those is not commensurate with anything from the you know 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, or 90s. So how do you see balancing the potential of of you know you can implement those sort of soft densities? It's totally um, practical and feasible, but the market suggests. It's not going to happen. So, where where do we where do we go in that scenario? And and it's not going to be easy. Uh, and so, if this is what we collectively, as citizens, decide we want for our city, we're going to have to figure out how to do it. Um, because often we raise these points, and it's been talked about. I'm not the first to talk about this. It's been you know, well canvassed. But it all, you know, becomes, you know, it's not feasible. And so, but I guess what I'm sort of trying to tease out a bit is what makes it not feasible? And let's deal with those issues that undermine the feasibility of what we're seeking to achieve. So there's um, uh, tax policy to an extent, the treatment of um, uh, family dwellings, the, um, the income requirements around uh, the pension. Stamp duty is a massive um, incentive to, 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 to not allow redevelopment to occur. This is one of the reasons why this, this massive mismatch between housing um, stock and, uh, and housing needs is because there's massive inertia against uh, moving to a right size home. Until recently, strata schemes were so impossibly difficult to uh, dissolve uh, that stratas were sort of locked in place. So there was this implicit um, uh, sort of pressure on a developer building a strata scheme to get as much in it as possible because once it's here, it's never ever going to move again. So one of the reforms that the government did, and we did it quite easily in the end, was moving to a special resolution, not a unanimous resolution, to dissolve a strata scheme. The thing that we had to do there though, and the reason we got through it, was we, because you can quite easily, you know, quite um, uh, easily imagine the situation where a minority could be oppressed. You know, a, a rapacious developer could buy 75% of the unit entitlement, and the the um, the the the, the, the uh, vulnerable person living in the the other apartment uh, gets pushed out of their home. So we ensured that there was a fairness test where hard tests uh, tests for hardship could go through the Land and Environment Court. So recognising the need for people to participate and having governance systems um, systems to recognise opportunity to participate is really important. I think part of the shame is we've gone for codes and as of right approaches that say, well, people aren't going to like it, so let's just do it to them. Um, I think instead it's explaining the choice and curating the choice um, and looking at some of those things that make soft density unfeasible and dealing with them one by one. And the other one is, well, we're going to start somewhere, so let's just start doing it. And organically, it'll start to change the shape of the city. And the other point, you're quite right, in existing areas it's hard because you, you're retrofitting in, in existing areas, but let's make sure we don't repeat the, the same mistakes in new subdivisions by ensuring that we get the subdivision right, plan, um, uh, the subdivision pattern in the, uh, patterns right in the first place to make sure it doesn't happen again. Great. Well, look, we're going to wrap up the, the Q&A there, but thanks ever so much for some excellent questions and excellent answers as well, Rob. So fantastic. Look, we can continue the conversation. Very much encourage you to join us. We're going over to the UNSW galleries, which you would have passed and you came in um, uh, for some refreshment. And um, before you go, um, I've got two very special guests to welcome on the stage. I, I'd like to uh, introduce and welcome Katie Stevenson, 
and Isabel Vigona onto stage. And Isabel and Katie are uh, alumni of the UNSW planning program. Um, and they also coincidentally know a little bit about Rob as well. So we thought it would be nice for them to give the vote of thanks. So over to you. Um, as many of you in the audience know, this is Katie Stevenson, um, alumni 2007 of the Bachelor of Planning degree, former Chief of Staff to Rob through planning, infrastructure and education portfolios and soon to start as a new role um, as the New South Wales Executive Director of the Property Council of Australia. Yes, that wasn't awkward at all, Rob. Thank <laughs> you for that. <laughs> um, and I'd like to introduce Isabel Vagona. She's a 2019 graduate of the Bachelor of City Planning degree uh, and a policy advisor in our ministerial office between 2020 and 2022. And she's now working at the Department of Planning as a senior manager in the planning delivery unit. Well, what a special evening tonight has been for all of us to hear from Rob and to celebrate the incredible impact that he's made and will continue to have on the built environment here in New South Wales. It's particularly lovely to be here among friends and I'd also like to acknowledge all of those people in the audience who've been involved with Rob along the journey and share in his successes over the years. Rob's achievements are too many to name, so I'll just call out some of the firsts. He was the first Minister for Public Spaces the first New South Wales Minister for Active Transport, the first minister to have studied in the field. <laughs> first of many, we hope. Uh, he established the first container deposit scheme here in New South Wales and established the Greater Cities Commission, the Greater Sydney Parklands, Placemaking New South Wales and School Infrastructure New South Wales. Rob has truly been an incredible leader in this space. He's challenged, provoked, as we've seen tonight, uh, and led many important discussions and debates. And he's done all of this with his trademark, kind, compassionate, and collaborative style. He's inspired, mentored, and nurtured so many students and future leaders of our profession. And Isabel and I stand here tonight representing just two of so many who have benefited from his incredible wisdom, friendship and support. We planners have adopted him as one of our own and I know just how proud he is to be an honorary member of the Planning Institute of Australia and a close friend of our UNSW community. Rob, the ripple effect of your impact will be felt for many, many years and yet we know that your contribution will continue and the best is yet to come. Rob, you've inspired a lot of young planners coming through this UNSW course, and it's only fitting that your first post-politics speech is here. Um, you've always made time to support the university and are a lifelong learner no. yourself. When I was at uni, Rob, you were in, your, uh, in the planning portfolio for the first time, and we would go on organisation of planning student pub crawls with a face, your face, on our collars saying stoked. <laughs> As uh, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed students, we were so stoked to be entering an industry where our planning minister spoke about the lessons we were learning about at university, the importance of community, place and good design. By doing this, you created a space also for future politicians and ministers to follow doing the same. Now knowing you more, I know that would make you cringe so much <laughs> that we had uh, your face on our collars um, because you've never been about the spectacle or the self-recognition, but about the genuine service and making New South Wales a better place. Thank you, Rob, for the brilliant mind and brilliant heart that you've put to work over the past 17 years. Did I count that right? Um, and thank you, UNSW, for continuing to pave a path for curious minds to enter the constantly challenging and interesting space of planning. And with great privilege, we provide you a gift on behalf of UNSW. Oh, oh. University. Oh wow, that's like 1907. To, yeah, it's 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 legit. It's real. Wow. <laughs> oh, thank you, everyone. That's very very sweet. Thank so you. just to just yeah. to show, you, yeah. it's uh, it's an original print from the 1909 the uh, Royal, Royal Commission. Commission on Sydney's Improvement, and uh, yeah. as luck would have it, it's a proposal for the redevelopment of Darlinghurst Jail. So it's around the corner from here. Yeah. <laughs> thank you all. <laughs> 